predictions of ocean primary productivity, so how we get ocean biology from satellites. Um, so I, I don't know if that. I'll, I'll let you. Like, I can explain that more. That. About, I'll yeah. just say that you're good. Um, oh, you're oh boy, this get, yeah, this summer, when so that's you fine, I know, you don't want to reveal, yeah, <laughs> the sordid details. Okay, should I say it then, um, okay. for now, or? Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right, let's take the room. Okay, cool. Take it away. Thanks so much. So um, I'm a graduate student in the oceanography department, and this quarter I'm funded by the NASA Washington Space Grant. And so I hope by the end of this talk you'll get a sense of why NASA might want to fund oceanographers to do research. And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, how we use satellites to make predictions of ocean primary productivity, which is basically the the biology of the surface oceans, and how I've been using container ships to ground truth or validate those data. <clears throat> sure. So my talk is uh, going to be in three parts today. I'm first going to talk about um, what ocean primary productivity is and why we care about it. Second, I'll be talking about how oceanographers use satellite predictions um, of the ocean surface to estimate global primary productivity. And finally, I'll talk about some of the research I've been doing to ground truth or validate these estimates. So first, what is ocean primary productivity and why do we care about it? You can see here are um, some photomicrographs of the ocean phytoplankton, which are the plants of the surface ocean. They're incredibly abundant. They're about a million in a teaspoon of seawater. And they're photosynthetic, so they produce carbon from uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They fix it into biomass. And in the process, they produce oxygen. And um, they are responsible as a whole for about half of the oxygen in our atmosphere. So you can thank them for about every other breath you take. Um, they're also the base of the marine food web so that any animal that you think of as an ocean animal relies on its original energy um, to come from these phytoplankton. And finally, they provide a sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. Uh, these are some really beautiful photomicrographs of phytoplankton, and um, you can see in the upper left-hand corner are diatoms. They're uh, silica-forming. Uh, phytoplankton that form their shells out of glass. Then up in the upper right-hand corner, this rigatoni-like guy is a uh, coccolithophore, and they form their shells out of calcium carbonate. And then down here, the kind of disco gloves are, um, are dinoflagellates, another type of phytoplankton. So the way that primary productivity works is that plants fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into organic matter. Uh, through the process of photosynthesis. And phytoplankton do that in the surface ocean. Um, we should have had a pointer. Shoot. There isn't a pointer, is there? OK. I will just point. Um, so you can see this is a schematic of the surface ocean. And um, just like all, all land plants do, as you can imagine, phytoplankton need light, they need nutrients, they need water, and they need carbon dioxide to grow. And one of the limitations that phytoplankton have in the surface ocean is they have to be in the euphotic zone, which is about the top 100 meters of the water column. This is where the sunlight gets down into the water column. Um, and the other limitation they have is the wind mix layer of the surface ocean. And on average, that mix layer is about 50 meters, but it really depends on the conditions of wind. So in the wintertime, you can imagine it gets much deeper than the euphotic zone. In the summertime, it can be very shallow. 
And I'll be talking about a few rates of primary productivity throughout the talk, and I wanted to introduce them to you here. So gross primary productivity is just the rate of photosynthesis conducted by phytoplankton in the surface oceans. Net primary productivity is the rate of that photosynthesis is minus how much the plants respire or take, take carbon back up to do their cellular processes. And then finally, net community productivity, which I'll be talking about a little later, is the gross primary productivity minus community respiration, or how much respiration goes on in the whole water column by bacteria or other animals and plants together. Another important aspect of productivity in the ocean is something that we call the biological pump. And the way that this works is that phytoplankton in the surface ocean take up carbon and then eventually they sink and die into the deep ocean. And when they do that, they bring their bodies with them, the carbon that they took up from the surface ocean. And so in a sense, this is a way that atmospheric carbon dioxide is pumped from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. When they get down into the deep ocean, they stay there in the deep ocean for about a thousand years as the, as the deep ocean circulates before it gets back to the surface. And so this is a way for the ocean to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere on a time scale of about a thousand years. This export to the deep ocean that you can see from that arrow there is proportional to the net community productivity I was talking about in the last slide, the photosynthesis minus community respiration. And the magnitude of this biological pump is estimated to be about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, which is uh, similar to the total amount of fossil fuel emissions that uh, the world had about last year. We started out at about five when I started grad school, and <laughs> now we're up to 10. So um, the biological pump is something that we would really like to understand as oceanographers because it feeds back on climate. Another um, important thing about phytoplankton that we want to understand globally is how will their primary productivity change over time? And there was a study that came out in 2010 that showed that the amount of chlorophyll in the surface ocean, which is the pigment that phytoplankton used to fix sunlight, um, declined by about 40% from 1950 to 2000. So there's been a steady decline in surface ocean chlorophyll, and that decline has been correlated with an increase in sea surface temperature. The other thing that might affect some species of um, phytoplankton, especially coccolithophores, is ocean acidification. And um, that has been happening as the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has been increasing. Uh, it's, carbon dioxide is a weak acid when it is absorbed in seawater. And these calcium carbonate forming phytoplankton find it harder to form their shells at lower pH levels. So, in order to get a really global picture of how primary productivity is changing, it would be great to use pictures from space. And that's what I'm talking about next, is how oceanographers use satellite observations to estimate primary productivity. So here's a, a picture of the ocean surface. And depicted is chlorophyll concentration on the color bar. You can see that there are very high concentrations of chlorophyll in the high latitudes and high concentrations near the equator, and lower concentrations in these blue colors in what we call the subtropical gyres or the ocean deserts. And the reason for that is that the high latitudes have upwelling and nutrients from below come up into the surface ocean, phytoplankton use them and grow a lot. In the subtropical gyres, there's downwelling and nutrients are not replenished as easily. So we got this picture from a satellite. Um, and basically, we have an instrument on satellites called a radiometer that is able to measure ocean color at the surface. And the simple way that this works is that chlorophyll, the pigment, reflects green. So the more chlorophyll you have, the greener the water looks to the radiometer. And oceanographers have tweaked this to get very good estimates of chlorophyll concentration over the surface ocean to estimate the biomass of phytoplankton globally. So the first satellite that was able to really get a truly global picture of the surface ocean chlorophyll was called Sea Star. And you can see it way up there before it was deployed in the lab with the, the long arms are its uh, solar panels. And the instrument itself was called Sea Whiffs. And 
this is the, the color sensor. It was deployed in 1997, and it immediately began to give us really excellent pictures or data about ocean color. And about 13 years later, the satellite suddenly stopped communicating with Earth. We don't really know why, but we could not get data from it anymore. But it had a really good run for about 13 years. And luckily, in the meantime, another satellite was deployed called Aqua with a similar sensor called MODIS. And so we have about a 15-year continuous record of surface ocean chlorophyll. And um, this, hopefully this will work. This link, um, which I am hoping to show you, it's funny how it never works in real life. Like, you practice and practice, and it doesn't work in real life. Um, hold on a sec. All right, I'll give it one more shot, and then I'll keep going if, I'm, if I miss it. All right, that's a fail. Sorry, guys. Um, so I will, you, you guys should just, oh, here we go. All right, we got it. Okay, so this is an animation of about 10 years of the sea wolf's data going through seasonal changes in surface chlorophyll in the ocean. And you can see the trends that we saw in the static picture where we've got really high chlorophyll in the high latitudes and the equator. Um, there's Hawaii, you can see some blooms showing up around Hawaii seasonally. And then you can see that seasonally, the chlorophyll changes latitudinally, so it kind of grows and shrinks depending on sunlight and nutrient availability over the Pacific. And as we're coming back to Southeast Asia and Japan, you can see some of the coastal trends in, in chlorophyll, where there are a lot of nutrients running off the land. You can kind of get a sense of how currents transport phytoplankton blooms. You can see them moving a little bit. And, um, you can also see the land-based chlorophyll, so a very similar estimate from satellites is used to estimate terrestrial primary productivity. And then as we're coming around here uh, to Africa, you can, you can see some of the river influence off of the land into the ocean. Coming off the west coast of Africa there uh, is the Congo River. And so, this is a really nice tool for oceanographers to use to get a sense of how things are changing spatially, temporally, interannually across the ocean surface. All right. Hopefully it will let me keep going here. Shoot, come on. Okay. So one of the interesting observations that researchers made using the CWIFS data is that there was a significant decrease in chlorophyll concentration between 1998 and 2003. And you can see the data from 2003 at the top, 1998 in the middle, and the difference from 2003 to 98 at the bottom of chlorophyll data. And what they found was that in the subtropical gyres, these ocean desert regions, you can see these, these deep blue colors were a significant decrease in chlorophyll over that period of time, which was co correlated with a rise in sea surface temperature. And the hypothesis that oceanographers have to explain this is that at low latitudes, the surface ocean really relies on mixing of nutrients from below to um, kind of fuel primary productivity. But as the surface of the ocean warms, 
the, the water column stratifies and it's much more difficult for water to mix from below to the surface, fewer nutrients are provided and fewer productivity, or less productivity is, is able to happen. Um, but the problem is chlorophyll, which we have a great picture of now, is not equivalent to productivity exactly. It's a measure of biomass, it's not a rate. And how are we gonna try to predict a rate from a measure of biomass? So the classical approach that oceanographers have used to get productivity rates is a shipboard estimate of primary productivity using carbon-14 as a tracer. So it's a radioactive isotope. And the way this method works is you go out on a ship, you make a water sample, and you add a known amount of carbon-14 to your sample. And then you incubate your bottle over the side of the ship at the light level that the water would have been exposed to naturally. You have some dark bottles as controls, and you wait a certain amount of time, six to 24 hours, and then you filter your sample. And then you measure how much carbon-14 is on the surface of your sample, and you've got a rate of productivity. You can see um, this curve is kind of a uh, schematic of a lot of different observations. You can see that the peak in productivity is not at the surface, but a little bit lower down. And that's because phytoplankton get sunburned just like we do. They don't like to be at the very top of the water column. They do a lot better when they have kind of a medium amount of light. But as the light declines, they also lose productivity until they get to the point where they don't have any light anymore. So this sounds like a great method, but there are some challenges to doing shipboard estimates of primary productivity. First of all, time on research ship is is very expensive. Right now on the Tommy G. Thompson, which is our research vessel at the University of Washington, it costs about $40,000 a day to go out and do measurements. Um, it's also very time consuming to do these incubations. Once you spike your sample with carbon-14, you have to sit there for six to 24 hours letting it be at the conditions that it would normally be in the ocean. So it, that makes it impossible to sample large areas of the ocean at once, which is what you would want to do if you want to get a sense of ground truth in your satellite. And there are some flaws in this method. Um, one of them is just referred to as bottle effects, which basically means you're taking a sample, putting it in an environment that it would not normally be in, and you're changing some things about its environment. And then you can also have recycling of the, the carbon-14 tracer. So you can imagine you put it in there, the phytoplankton takes it up, and then some bacteria break the phytoplankton down again in the course of your experiment you're not really measuring net productivity, you might be measuring net community productivity. So how do we bridge the gap between these very small scale spatial data and our larger satellite estimates? It would be nice if we could take these measurements, what we know about productivity from these measurements, and bridge the gap a little bit. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about in the next couple of slides. So, Researchers have developed productivity algorithms to be able to bridge this gap, and the first one was developed by researchers at Oregon State University in 1997, and it was called the Vertically Generalized Productivity Model. So what they did was they took thousands of these shipboard carbon-14 productivity measurements and chlorophyll data that was taken at the same time, and they also took a lot of studies of light and productivity and how it changes depending on the depth in the water column. So you can see here that light at 200 meters is a lot lower than it is at the surface, and the wavelength of the light also changes in terms of how it gets through the water column. So they put all these things together and they developed an algorithm that predicts depth integrated net primary productivity in the ocean from satellite derived chlorophyll, surface irradiance, or the light hitting the surface, sea surface temperature, which you can also get from satellites, and then the photo period or the length of the day in each place and the depth of the euphotic zone or the light layer, which you can estimate from models. And here's a picture of what they got for July 2004. I just pulled this off their website. This is net primary productivity from their model. And you can see it has some of the same lat latitudinal trends that we saw in the chlorophyll data. High values at high latitudes and at the equator, low values in the subtropical gyres. And, um, they have a ton of information at their website if you guys are curious to find out more. The second productivity algorithm was also developed by this group and um, it uses a very different idea. 
It's called the carbon-based productivity model. And what it assumes is that ocean particles scatter light and that the backscattering of ocean particles is related to the concentration of carbon from phytoplankton in the surface ocean. And this seems like kind of an abstract idea of backscattering, but it's what is used for the X-ray machines when we go through the um, TSA now. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But anyway, um, this algorithm predicts depth integrated net primary productivity from satellite derived chlorophyll backscattering surface irradiance and how light attenuates with depth. So how do these two models compare? They're using very different techniques to try to get the same answer. You can see this is a plot comparing the two. The carbon-based model, the, the one with the backscatter, is at the top. The VGPM, the one uh, with chlorophyll, is in the middle. And the difference between the two is at the bottom. And you can see big differences would show up as, as deep reds and deep blues. And there are a lot of areas of big differences between the models. So they haven't figured it out quite yet. And furthermore, there's a survey of about 24 of these algorithms that came out in 2006 that found agreement only within a factor of two between all of these different models. So clearly, there needs to be some ground truth and some validating of the absolute productivity levels to help these algorithms do a better job of predicting global primary productivity. They do come up with a pretty good estimate of net primary productivity of about 50 gigatons a year. That's equivalent to how much productivity is on land each year. So the ocean and the land are about equal in their contributions to the biosphere. But they have the most difficulty in spatial and interannual variability. And that's the stuff we'd really like to understand as oceanographers. And the final satellite method that I would like to talk about quickly is estimates of net community productivity. So that's that export that I was talking about earlier in the talk, how much of the total productivity gets to the deep ocean. And um, to a first order estimation, this export has been found to depend on temperature and the total productivity or the net productivity. And so if you have lower temperatures, there's higher export. If you have higher net productivity, there's higher export. And so if you run this kind of little model through you could estimate from your satellite data how much is exported. And that's how researchers do it these days. So how do we ground truth these estimates? How do we improve them? They're a little bit rough right now. The method that my lab has been using and a lot of labs are using these days is to use volunteer observation ships. And uh, here's a picture of the container ship that I used for a lot of my PhD research. The benefits of volunteer observation ships is they cover the same route regularly because they're doing shipping routes. So this is a, a picture of, the, in black is the route that this ship went on from Hong Kong to Long Beach, California, about every month or so. They're an inexpensive sampling platform if you can convince a shipping company to let you go on their ship. And you are able to sample surface seawater all along the route of the container ship because the container ship has something called the sea chest, which basically allows water to come into the ship as ballast, and that water is pumped for cooling throughout the ship. And so if you can tap off of that water, you can basically have water all along the cruise in the mix layer, as we call it, the, the wind mix layer, and get a representative sampling of that. And these ships cross the Pacific, which is where I was doing my research in about two weeks. So it provides you with what we call synoptic coverage or a snapshot of a large area in a short period of time. And this is great if we want to be able to compare to a satellite picture. So these are pictures of some of the great things about sampling on container ships. You get to visit really interesting places. This is the, the lower left is the port of Kaohsiung in Taiwan. Um, you get to see what the shipping industry is really like from your porthole window. Um, you get to eat really good food and spend time with really interesting people. This is, um, I was on a Chinese container ship during Chinese New Year and had an awesome feast with everybody. And you get to see some um, interesting wildlife now and then. So those are all the benefits. And then there are some downsides. Um, you're working in the engine room of the container ship. So it's extremely loud, 
extremely high vibration environment. Um, it sort of feels like you're inside the Death Star. It's just like an incredibly enormous space. And you kind of go crazy. This is one of our research technicians who was, we, when we were finally dismantling our work, and that's kind of how you feel on a regular basis when you're working down there. Um, this is our, our lab setup down there. I'll talk a little bit about it in a while, but um, you can see that in a high vibration environment, that's not going to be so easy to keep all those wires working well. So there are some challenges. And then the, the biggest challenge is you can't do an incubation, the, the normal method that any oceanographer would use for productivity. You can only sample the mixed layer. You can't sit there and wait with your bottle. So you have to do something where you make an in situ measurement. You make something, make a measurement of something along the way. And um, the method that we used is using oxygen as a tracer of productivity. And we used two different oxygen tracer methods. The first one is called the oxygen argon method. And basically, what this does is it uses oxygen as a tracer of photosynthesis and respiration in the surface ocean. So we know that photosynthesis produces oxygen and respiration consumes it. And we want to find that community productivity, which is the difference of the two. So we're already pretty far along if we measure oxygen. But if we measure argon, we're even farther along because argon is what we call an inert analog of oxygen. It behaves very similarly to oxygen in its solubility. So anytime the water heats up or cools down, they'll do, do it similarly. If bubbles get entrained by a wave, they'll do that similarly. But argon is a noble gas. It has no biological sources or sinks. So if we look at the ratio of oxygen to argon in the surface ocean, we can get a sense of the biological effect on the oxygen budget, how much the photosynthesis is contributing. And we can correct for the gas exchange by looking at an estimate from wind speed. And that's also a satellite-based estimate. So we use a lot of great data from satellites to, to get these estimates underway. To take a discrete sample, we use an evacuated flask, and we bring it back to the lab and analyze it on a mass spectrometer. And the nice thing is there's no incubation needed. And then we can extrapolate these to continuous data by using a shipboard mass spectrometer. And that was in that picture I showed you a little earlier. And basically what this does is it has an equilibrator cartridge that equilibrates the water right there, analyzes the gas, and gives you continuous estimates of oxygen argon in the water, and then you can get net community productivity. But we'd also like to get gross productivity, and how are we going to do that? So this method is a little more complicated, and it involves the three stable isotopes of oxygen in the surface ocean. Um, this is kind of a super nerdy method. But basically, the way it works is that most environmental processes take oxygen isotopes and fractionate them, depending on their mass. So some processes prefer a lighter oxygen, oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, a heavier oxygen. But in the stratosphere, there are some ozone reactions that have no dependence on mass. They don't care. They'll just take up any oxygen that they see. Um, and what happens as a result of that difference is that there's an anomaly in atmospheric oxygen that we can measure when we measure the isotopes of oxygen. And if we measure photosynthetic oxygen, we wouldn't see that anomaly. So we can parse out the influence of photosynthesis and gas exchange on the surface ocean. And you can see how that breaks down in the next slide. So this 17 delta, or cap delta, as we often refer to it, is the estimate of the anomaly. For purely photosynthetic oxygen, we have a very high cap delta value. For purely gas exchange oxygen, it's much lower. And our sample will most likely be somewhere in between the two. So we can get a sense of the proportion of oxygen from photosynthesis and the proportion from gas exchange. And we use the same kind of method, take a flask, and in fact, you can make this measurement and the oxygen argon method measurement on the same sample when you bring it back to the lab. So you get two measurements for the price of one, and you get gross and net primary productivity. This one we haven't figured out yet how to do on a shipboard underway, because isotopic measurements are much more finicky. So here's some results from a container ship cruise. 
using the oxygen isotope method. Uh, this was done by a graduate student, a former graduate student in our lab, Lori Geranek, and she took several container ship cruises going from California to Australia and New Zealand. And you can see the, the cruise tracks are superimposed on the chlorophyll. So you can see the high chlorophyll at the equator and then the lower chlorophyll in the subtropical gyres around the equator. And so you can see that the productivity measurements, even without knowing which are which, you can see there's a peak at the equator. So that makes sense. But Lori's measurements are the top two. So the first one is the gross carbon production from the oxygen isotope method. The second one down this dashed line is taking that measurement and making it proportional to carbon-14 measurements, which is kind of a method that, um, the method I discussed earlier, but it's a way that we use to compare, and it ends up being a little bit lower. But below even that dashed line, you can see the carbon-based productivity model and the VGPM, those two satellite algorithms. They're showing the same spatial trends, so they have a peak at the equator, but they're not as high as the, uh, the field data. So it's possible that the satellite-based methods are underestimated by as much as two times uh, based on her data set. So uh, my last few slides are going to talk to a bit about some of my thesis research. And um, the region of the Pacific that I'm looking at is a really interesting region called the transition zone, the North Pacific transition zone. And it's called the transition zone because it's between the subarctic and the subtropical gyres. And it's a region of very high atmospheric carbon dioxide uptake. So this map in the upper left-hand corner shows you the net flux of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean. And regions of blue and purple are regions where there's a lot of carbon going into the ocean. Regions of red and yellow are regions where there's super saturation of carbon dioxide and it's actually evading to the atmosphere. So there's this region across the Pacific that has very high atmospheric carbon dioxide uptake. And I mentioned earlier that one of the ways that we know that carbon is exported to the deep ocean is through the biological pump. And so we were interested in measuring productivity across this region to see whether it is a region of high productivity as well. And another reason that we thought it might be interesting biologically is because it has a feature called the transition zone chlorophyll front, which is shown on the right-hand side and I've got a bit of a better picture of it here. So this chlorophyll front migrates seasonally and it, in um, the winter months it goes all the way down to about 30 degrees north. You may remember this from the, the movie I showed. You could, you could really see it going back and forth. And then as you get into the summer months, the chlorophyll pulls back and this front, the kind of the boundary between the two is a real uh, great habitat for a lot of higher animals. Um, loggerhead turtles and albacore tuna actually follow the front. People have studied the migration seasonally and they, they tend to migrate with the front. Um, and scientists think that deep winter mixing brings nutrients into the surface in the winter time so there's productivity all the way down to 30 degrees north, but then those nutrients are depleted and it, that boundary relaxes. So we were interested in studying this region more closely and this container ship, the OCL Tianjin, went um, really close to that region. And so we got permission to use it for our, our measurements and it, it was a really wonderful opportunity to be able to survey this region. And you can see the ship doesn't go exactly on the same path all the time. These are all the cruises that we took. Um, but it covers it pretty well. And our goal was to continuously estimate productivity across the transition zone and then compare with satellite-based productivity measurements. And so this research is still in progress, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the study site looks like and kind of where our questions are coming from. And hopefully in the next few months, we'll really be able to pin down the comparison between satellite estimates in this region and our shipboard measurements. Um, so I really sped through this. So I hope you guys have a lot of questions. Um, 
I wanted to close by saying that ocean primary productivity, as I told you to start out with, is the base of the marine food web. It's very important because it produces about half of the oxygen that we have in our atmosphere. And it's a major sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide. We can use satellite measurements of ocean color to derive estimates of ocean chlorophyll, and then use chlorophyll to take it a step farther and estimate global ocean primary productivity using algorithms that take chlorophyll light and temperature and backscattering, some other things. And then the ground truthing with container ships is relatively inexpensive compared to research vessels. It provides you with synoptic coverage and oxygen can be an in situ tracer of primary productivity in the surface ocean. So thanks, and happy to answer questions. Do you mean in productivity? Right, right. yeah, and um, that's a great question. So I think in oil spills, like in, in the case of the Gulf oil spill, what was really interesting was most of that oil was coming out at a great depth. And so it didn't seem to influence the surface community as much as it would have if it had been like the Axon Valdez where it really did you know, affect the surface. But um, I do think it affects things, but the, the microbial community breaks down oil pretty quickly and I think they've been finding in the Gulf of Mexico that it's recovered a lot faster than they thought. I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, but um, I think there's a lot of rebound there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your colleagues uh, actually from that other data. Mm -hmm. uh, you compared it against the, I guess, the two known models. Right. Yeah, no, no, we haven't. So I, I think the way that it tends to work in the community is we publish papers, and then the, the people who work on the algorithms kind of do their own stuff, yeah. But it's a really good question, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Satellites weren't exactly accurate, like the satellite imagery. Um, the, the chlorophyll is accurate, but the taking, making the right, step 